Tonight on Greater Boston, Michael Curry of the NAACP and former federal judge Nancy Gertner joined me to wade into day three of the January 6th hearings, which was all about Mike Pence and the target put on his back or neck by the actions of Donald Trump. But while the hearing was billed as focusing on the pressure the then president put on Pence to illegally overturn the 2020 election results on his behalf, much of today's testimony focused on another man. And John Eastman. Mr. Eastman. Dr. Eastman. Dr. Eastman. John Eastman, an attorney Trump found on Fox News, who, as the committee laid out today, was the driving force in trying to get Pence to overturn the election results and give Trump a second term in office. And all we are demanding of Vice President Pence is this afternoon at 1 o'clock, he let the legislatures of the state look into this so we get to the bottom of it and the American people know whether we have control of the direction of our government or not. It was John Eastman who, according to a bunch of witnesses we heard from today, first came up with the decertification idea and relentlessly pushed it to anyone who would listen. Mr. Eastman from the beginning, said to the president that there was both legal as well as historical precedent for the vice president to overturn the election. And all the, the players led by uh, Mr. Eastman got wrapped around the axle. But as we also heard from nearly every witness live and on tape today, no one else could find any merit to the argument, and several outright warned Eastman how dangerous the tactic was. There was no basis in the Constitution or laws of the United States at all for the theory espoused by Mr. Eastman at all, none. The way it was communicated to me was that um, uh, Pat Cipollone thought the idea was, uh, was nutty and had uh, at one point uh, confronted Eastman uh, basically with the same sentiment. He said, you're gonna turn around and tell 78 plus million people in this country that your theory is this is how you're going to invalidate their votes because you think the election was stolen. And I said, they're not going to tolerate that. He said, you're going to cause riots in the streets. And he said, words to the effect of there's been violence in the history of our country, Eric, to protect the democracy or protect the republic. And yet, Eastman persisted, despite the fact that, according to the testimony we heard today, even Eastman didn't really believe the path that he was pushing was legally sound. Said, you know, said, John, basically what you have is some text that may be a little bit ambiguous, but then nothing else that would support it, including the fact that nobody would ever want that to be the rule. Wouldn't we lose nine to nothing in the Supreme Court? And again, he initially started, well, maybe you'd only lose seven to two, but ultimately acknowledged that no, we would lose nine zero. No judge would support his argument. Legal advice that at least one man did listen to despite the danger that followed. The vice president never budged from the position that I have described as his first instinct, which was that it just made no sense from everything that he knew and had studied about our constitution that one person would have that kind of authority. And so as Pence set out to do his constitutional duty on January 6, 2021, the committee recapped the events that followed, starting with the president's address to that crowd. Mike Pence is going to have to come through for us. And if he doesn't, that will be a, a sad day for our country. And Mike Pence, I hope you're going to stand up for the good of our Constitution and for the good of our country. And if you're not, I'm going to be very disappointed in you, I will tell you right now. But then came Trump's tweet at 2.24 that afternoon. Mike Pence didn't have the courage to do what should have been done to protect our country and our Constitution, setting off the real chaos. Nothing but a traitor, and he deserves to burn with the rest of them. It was clear that it 
was escalating and escalating quickly. So then when that tweet, the Mike Pence tweet, um, was sent out, um, I remember us saying that that was the last thing that needed to be tweeted at that moment. The situation was already bad, and so it felt like he was pouring gasoline on the fire by tweeting that. 30 seconds later, rioters already inside the Capitol opened the East Rotunda door just down the hall. And just 30 seconds after that, rioters breached the crypt, one floor below the vice president. The Secret Service couldn't control the situation and do their job of keeping him safe. At 2.26 p.m., Secret Service rushed Vice President Pence down the stairs. I think they had been trying to figure out whether they had a clear route to get us to wherever there it was that they wanted to move us to. We moved pretty quickly down the stairs and through various hallways and tunnels to the secure location. Uh, upon arriving there, there was further discussion as to whether or not we were going to leave the Capitol complex or stay where we were. Vice President Pence and his team ultimately were led to a secure location where they stayed for the next four and a half hours, barely missing rioters a few feet away. Approximately 40 feet. That's all there was. 40 feet. I'm joined again by Michael Curry, chair of the National NAACP Advocacy and Policy Committee, and Nancy Gertner, retired federal judge and senior lecturer at Harvard Law School. We were also supposed to be joined by former chair of the New Hampshire Republican Party, Jennifer Horn, again as well, but she had a technical issue right before taping. Judge Michael, good to see you both. Thanks for being here. Good to be with you. Judge Gertner, starting with you, what's your prime takeaway from t day three? I actually thought, first, I think the, the, the hearings are, are brilliant because they're making their case through Republican yeah. voices, which is very interesting. In addition, there was, so the first, the first day was that Trump knew that the, uh, that the election was fine and that, in fact, there had been no fraud. Today is that he knew that Eastman's theory of how to set aside the election was, was unconstitutional. Again, multiple voices telling him that that was illegal. And then there was a moment during Judge Luddick's presentation, which was very interesting, where he talked about that Trump at the very least had what they called uh, wrongful, willful blindness mm -hmm. about the truth of the matter. That is a criminal law term. That is a criminal law term. You talk about willful blindness when the, you know, the bank robber says it's right to rob a bank. It's my money after all. And in <laughs> fact, someone says, you know, that's actually not true. And you said, I don't want to know. So I, it was it was willful blindness, which is a criminal law term. The other thing is the notion that of the multiple lawyers who were advising Trump, he seeks out the guy Eastman, who's going to tell him this, who's going to sell him this bill of goods. And again, in the law, there's a concept of you know relying on the advice of counsel, but you can't find your counsel on Fox News. <laughs> you can't find the guy who's going to say what you want to say. So it, this was closer to Trump's frankly, criminal culpability uh, for the events of January 6th and for the efforts to interfere with the, with the election than I have seen. You know, by the way, you mentioned uh, how brilliant it was to do this all through Republican voices. For those not familiar with former federal appellate court judge uh, Ludig, he is a conservative icon, to say the least. For those, Michael, what was your prime takeaway from uh, day three? Same as the judges, I think there are some things that really stuck out with me. Uh, one, um, you know, I think we've been waiting for a Republican leaders, particularly uh, in the legal field, to really speak out uh, full-throatedly uh, against what this president was doing. I think this hearing process is giving us uh, a lens into what was being discussed within Republican circles, particularly legal circles, around uh, Eastman, uh, Giuliani, uh, the Trump's actions to overturn this election. And we've been waiting for that. So I think the hearing today was interesting. I think what shocked me mostly at the end of the hearing was uh, Judge Ludic's point. And I thought he was compelling today, but he talked about Donald Trump being a clear and present danger yeah. on our democracy. And he hammered home this point at the end that it's not just about January 6th, it's about the next presidential election. If a Republican, in particular a Trump or a nominee from the Republican Party, is not elected, is not um, uh, taking that oath, um, we could see another January 6th. Uh, and he 
um, was pretty compelling about that. Uh, I would argue one of the most important lines of the whole day, and it was the final line of the whole day from the witnesses, what you just described from Judge Ludwig. So, you, Nancy Gertner, you have the poor, pathetic Rudy Giuliani as the primary purveyor of the big lie, and then you have the pathetic John Eastman with the big illegal, I guess you can call it. The only difference is he wasn't inebriated. And Eastman was the centerpiece today. Here's an incredible moment from Eric Hirschman in the White House Counsel's Office the day after uh, uh, January 6th, talking about a conversation he had with Eastman. Said, I only want to hear two words coming out of your mouth from now on. Orderly transition. Repeat those words to me. Eventually he said, orderly transition. I said, good, John. Now I'm going to give you the best free legal advice you're ever getting in your life. Get a great F in criminal defense lawyer. You're going to need it. And then I hung up on him. Nancy Gardner, was there any, any piece of the advice that John Eastman was giving the President of the United States that even in a moot court debate had even this much of legitimacy to it? No, this, that's what's so interesting about the testimony today. There was no legitimacy to it. So even, you know, originalists, uh, uh, <laughs> numbers of the people who testified are, you know, believe in the original intent of the Constitution, who said neither in the language nor in the surrounding debates nor in the precedent is there any basis for one to conclude that one man, namely the vice president, has a right uh, to set aside uh, the election. The other thing, by the way, which is which relates to your previous question about if, if Eastman believed that he had criminal responsibility, both for January 6th and perhaps for the efforts to get in touch with other state legislators, um, if he has criminal responsibility and he seeks a pardon for it, then so does Trump. They are they because Trump is following what is clearly uh, insubstantial, illegal uh, advice. So that was telling. And by the way, if people didn't see the hearing, what Judge Gertner is referring to is the point was made by Representative Aguilar that he did seek a pardon. He called Rudy Giuliani, Eastman did, on the phone after and said, I'd like to be put on the pardon list. And then when he's called before the January 6th committee, he takes the Fifth Amendment more than 100 times. And one of the great ironies is a guy who once said only mob members take the Fifth Amendment. You know who that guy was? Donald Trump. Donald, Michael the other thing is that Trump, Trump has now asked to call, go before the committee. Mm -hmm. in a, the latest social media. I actually think they should take him up on it because if he lies before the committee, as he is bound to do, that is a that is essentially a, a felony. Trust me, he's not showing up before the committee. <laughs> Michael, you know, uh, at the beginning of the hearings, uh, uh, Liz Cheney, Congresswoman Cheney said, you're going to hear at some point that when the chance of hang Mike Pence that uh, the president turned to someone and said it might not be a bad idea. I was sort of surprised that that didn't come up today. It seemed to fit today's discussion, assuming it was legit, and I assume she wouldn't say if it was. However, I came away with this more convinced than ever, uh, not only because of his inaction, the president's, not only because of this 224 tweet that I read before, which really was a call to action uh, uh, to the rioters, the insurrectionists on Capitol Hill, who were literally looking at their phones, waiting for marching orders, that Donald Trump would have been okay if Mike Pence had been executed on January 6th. Is that unfair? Is that hyperbole on my part? You, you know, I think we find ourselves often um, questioning what we saw and what we heard. I mean, Donald Trump is a master of getting us to question what we saw and what we heard. The reality is, is that he put his own interests over country. And if a violent insurrection would have uh, prolonged uh, hit the inevitable or uh, provided an opportunity for him to stay in the White House, he would have been fine with that. I think his rhetoric, his actions were clear. The timeline speaks for itself. And I think if, as a consequence, if that violent mob had attacked a Vice President Pence, uh, we would have got the Donald Trump we know, like the Donald Trump we saw in the rallies, the, the Donald Trump we've, we've seen in the White House that sort of dismisses violence if he thinks it serves his ultimate purpose. I think we got to stop questioning ourselves. He is who he says he is. <laughs> you know, let me, let me, I'm let sorry, let me Judge. Let just about that for a moment. Up until this presentation, you get the sense that Trump comes, goes before a camera and just says stuff. Mm -hmm. He says stuff whether he believes it or not. Mm -hmm. He just says it thoughtlessly. 
this presentation was about how thoughtful he was. You were told multiple times that the election was fine. You were told multiple times that Eastman was, was full of it. You were told multiple times that Pence was in jeopardy and you go ahead. This is more than just, I'm gonna say anything to the cameras. This was a, peer, this was a series of events uh, in which he was willfully going along with and even leading efforts to set aside the election and endanger people. Well, it's I would say, the, I would say the tweet was an incitement to say the, the least. You know, Judge Gertner, I want to return to something you said a minute ago, that if uh, Eastman uh, broke the law, then Trump broke the law. We had this discussion on the radio today, so my apologies for bringing it up uh, uh, again. But uh, I, some people know you're very close to Hillary Clinton. There were a lot of rumors you would be her attorney general. So put on that hat just for a second. I am among those who's criti criticized the, the meekness of the attorney general and worry that despite what I see is overwhelming evidence that he will take a pass on uh, uh, a criminal investigation of this president. Be the attorney general for a second, based only on three days of testimony, whatever else you've learned in the year and a half since January uh, 6. Did Donald Trump commit crimes? From what I have seen from based on the reporting, the answer is yes. Donald Trump's relationship to the rally is that that alone would have been a harder case to make because the, but political figures can, it's very difficult to get a political figure for incitement to riot. If you go back to the uh, efforts to convict members of the anti-war movement for things that occur during demonstrations, now there's a much more direct relationship here, but the bigger picture, which the committee is gonna get into, is not just the January 6 events, but the phone calls to state secretaries mm -hmm. of state, the That's coming, phone yes. call to Raffensperger, mm -hmm. You're now not talking again about a politician who got swept away by his own rhetoric. You're really talking about a plot, which is much more substantial. So yes, I would advise, I would advise convening a grand jury. Uh, it's a, there's no question that it's a decision that is fraught. I mean, I think Garland, if Garland is pausing, it's because, you know, the notion of convicting or prosecuting one's political enemies yeah. is a very, very difficult thing to do. But this is also a unique set of facts. So I, I think that there's enough to certainly convene a grand jury. Um, and if the grand jury hears what we've been hearing, to indict him. So, Michael Curry, I don't think anybody was about to appoint you attorney general, as far as I know, but you're a pretty <laughs> competent lawyer. What, what's your two cents on whether a crime has been committed so far, based on what you know? You know, I'm a, a Latin student from a Latin Academy, but I'm going to use a term we use in the legal profession is race ipsa loquitur, the thing speaks for itself. <laughs> um, the reality is he did commit a crime and we need the attorney general to act. But I understand, Jim, the politics of this, as the judge just pointed out. And sometimes the politics causes us to pause, right, on every level. And I think the politics here is we're going into a midterm election. This is, we're a divided nation. Uh, folks will look at this as a partisan witch hunt, um, and you have to make sure that if you if you if you if you go for the king or whatever that phrase is, you that you king, don't you miss. You have to kill him. Yeah, yeah right. you have to kill right. him. Yeah. So right. so there right. is a there is some caution here that I, I I wish that the attorney general would act decisively and swiftly because it is giving the rest of us some anxiety to know that we know he's guilty, but he's not being held accountable. Mm -hmm. You know, I th for those who have been criticizing the hearings, and I hear that a decent amount on the radio and social media out in the world, I have to say one of the things I thought they've really done well is create an historical record and do a pretty good job of education, putting things in context. And I thought a really important moment was the discussion today about Al Gore. And I don't think many people think about that. Al Gore was not just the vice president who had the same job that Mike Pence did a year and a half ago. He was a vice president who was running for the presidency. And it, had he done what John Eastman said that, Don, that uh, Mike Pence had the power to do, that it might have been President Gore, according to Eastman, rather than President Bush. Here is Gore. This is from an interview he did on Inauguration Day uh, last year, Al Gore. The United States of America, in all of human history, uh, in Lincoln's phrase, we still are the last best hope of humankind. Uh, and 
the choice between one's own uh, disappointment uh, in your personal career and upholding the the noble traditions of America's uh, democracy is a pretty easy choice when it comes down to it. And the reason I played that is those final words beyond the education, Nancy Gertner, pretty easy choice. I, I cannot tell a lie. The more I hear Mike Pence, describe his courage described, his heroism for doing what is his constitutional job. And I'm not belittling the threat that he was under, the danger he was in, that kind of thing. My attitude is, if you're a person of courage, if you're a hero, if you're a patriot, you show up at the damn hearings, you testify yourself, not just your counsel, not just your chief of staff. What's your reaction to that? You mean to whether or not Pence should show up? Yeah, this? yeah. Well, I mean, yes, that's what he ought to, to do, but he is walking a thin, a fine line here. Uh, he wants others to speak for him. He wants others to praise him for doing that which he had to do uh, so that he could run again. Um, you know, there's an interesting issue. If Ivanka Trump showed up, you should imagine that Pence should show up. Uh, you know, that <laughs> if his family members are saying that this was wrong, then Pence should show up. Um, and it's really quite extraordinary that we're congratulating him for doing that which has been done over the past, uh, you know, 200 years, 200 some odd years. I might add, it's not only the Gore comment that is interesting. At the very first day of the hearing, there was a discussion of Abraham Lincoln's letter to his staff, which was, you know, in anticipation of losing a second term and ensuring that, that everyone would accept the results, knowing, by the way, that were he to lose, virtually everything mm -hmm. that was fought for in the Civil War would be undone. And he said, orderly transition more important even than the principles we fought for in the Civil War, which is extraordinary. Well, not only was it beautiful, you got to see the handwriting of President Lincoln on the screen too, which was really moving. Michael, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah, I think, you know, it's so funny. Uh, I would say uh, Mike Pence is a coward, not for the reasons that Donald Trump called him a coward for not overturning this election. But throughout this presidency, Mike Pence has not pushed back on this president uh, and, and fought for this democracy. I think ultimately this has been a, a history lesson for all of us that when you have a leader who acts like a ruler, who makes horrible decisions that are not in the best interest of our country, who's bold enough, willing to stand up to that person? And I think Mike Prince, Mike Pence deserves no profile and courage um, because he's on record now but did not show up at the hearing. You know, Nancy Gertner, I asked you to be attorney general. Let's go back to being a judge for a second. If this case did come before you, and despite the fact that Donald Trump seems to say whatever pops into his head at any particular moment, we've had testimony from family members, from staff, from consultants, from lawyers, yet no testimony that said that Donald Trump himself ever said, I know I'm lying. I know that what I'm asking Mike Pence to do is illegal and or unconstitutional. Would that concern you as a judge or no? Not, not at all. Not at all, because the people said to him, and those people testified, they said to him multiple times, the election was fine, there's no there there, uh, you know, from one person after another. Yet he, the next day mm -hmm. or that afternoon said, you know, there was a big fraud here. People said to him that Eastman's theory was completely unconstitutional and illegal, and he went ahead and called people based on it. You rarely have a defendant saying, oh, I know okay. I'm about to do something illegal and I'm going to do it. You make your evidence by what others around him say about what he knew and then what he did. You know, we only have a couple of minutes left, but I want to talk about one other insurrectionist who actually also was in touch with uh, Mr. Eastman, and that is uh, Ginny Thomas, the wife of Clarence Thomas. Here's a headline, an exclusive in the Washington Post last night, talking about communication between Thomas and Eastman on top of what we already know, an email to 27 Republican legislators in Arizona overturned the results in Arizona, her texts that were sent to uh, Mark Meadows, chief of staff, again, arguing, uh, uh, fight hard, let's get this overturned. Michael Curry, quickly from you, what's your reaction to what we're learning about Ginny Thomas? 
deeply disturbing um, for any sitting Supreme Court justice to have a close family member trying to contribute to overturning an election and arguably a government um, should terrify us all. Uh, the seat, uh, the, cl the close proximity that she has uh, to our uh, uh, highest court in the land um, and to our seat of power in the White House should disturb us. So I, I think th this requires more investigation uh, and I, if possible, holding her accountable as well as many others. So uh, uh, I am where Michael is and then some. Are we both sexist dogs, uh, Judge Gertner? With respect to this or in general? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm Sorry. serious. I couldn't resist. I know. Right. You have um, a minute. No, no. I mean, I, I, I think that there ought to be an investigation of her, but uh, it should not be an investigation only of her. It's a, of everyone else who participated in this plot. That there is a plot is clear, that it was unconstitutional is clear, and everyone who participated in it, uh, it seems to me, should be investigated. They shouldn't go, just as this is related to the conversation about indicting Trump, mm -hmm. you shouldn't go after Ginny Thomas if she was a relatively minor player and there are other players that you are ignoring. So. The question is proportionality, but that she participated is ex just extraordinary. But very and quickly, the there's no question, no question in your mind, Judge Gertner, that her husband should recuse himself in anything relating to Donald Trump as a result no of that, correct? No question about it. And by Absolutely. the way, we should say that the uh, chair of the committee, Benny Thompson, who I believe is a friend of yours, I should have mentioned this, Mike Curry, is that not true? He is a friend. Uh, we uh, gained a friendship through the NAACP. But uh, uh, Benny Thompson announced today that they would be inviting Ginny Thomas to testify before the committee. So we'll see whether that happens. There's some rumors that Mike Pence, despite what I said a minute ago, may show up at a future hearing. More to learn next week. Judge Gertner, Michael Curry, as always, really appreciate your thoughts. Thanks so much to both of you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. The next hearing starts on Tuesday at 1 p.m. We'll bring you more analysis right here at 7 Tuesday night. And a reminder, you can listen live on GBH Radio 89.7, along with Marjorie Egan and me. You can also stream the hearings live at gbhnews.org or catch them live on the GBH World Channel, which is offering a full re-airing at 3 a.m. the morning after each hearing as well. That's it for now. We'll be back on Monday with the subjects of the Pulitzer Prize-winning podcast Suave, which follows a Philly man sentenced to die in in prison as a minor down his long path to freedom. Plus, the Times reporters behind This Will Not Pass, Trump, Biden, and the battle for America's future. That's Monday at 7. Thanks for watching, and please don't forget Ukraine.